Welcome everybody <laughs> back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. You're in the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And tonight we're going to talk about the Akshaya Mati Bodhisattva Sutra. Bodhisattva, uh, I've translated tonight inexhaustible, in, inexhaustible intellect. Akshaya Mati. This is Akshaya Mati. Um, and tonight's going to be an interesting night. Um, we're still in the sutra. We're still deep in the sutra. Um, but I, I decided to do something interesting tonight. Um, I keep, you know, we're deep in. We're, we've been deep in the sutra now for a while. Many, many, many hours. And I was thinking about it, you know, and I know that a new, new people have joined since we started our journey on this sutra. And we sort of reached this point where the Bodhisattva, Akshayamati, has coursed through all of these stages and had all of these visions. And, you know, I find myself sort of briefly bringing us all back up to speed as far as the Bodhisattva asking his question to the Buddha. But I was going to do something interesting tonight, actually, which was I'm going to go back to the beginning. And we're actually going to remember, I want to remember where this all started. Um, I'm excited about tonight, as usual. I, there's, you know, uh, it's been a long time since we started this sutra. I've learned a lot. I don't know about, I don't know about you, but I've learned a lot. And so going back in preparation for tonight, and rereading the beginning of the sutra, I decided, you know what? We need to just hear this again. We need to just do this again, given everything that we've, we've learned from the Buddha in this regard. I just want to have, I just want to say a few preliminary remarks. Um, I'm not going to read the whole sutra again. Don't worry. I just want to read the beginning and sort of in a way bring us back up to speed. I, I think. I think you'll hear why when once I get to reading it, if you've been here, especially the last 10 or a dozen sessions, you'll you'll definitely re, uh, realize why I wanted to return to the beginning. There's also a way in which I, I'm, I'm being very honest. I've learned a lot since we started doing this. You know, I, I prepare a lot for each class. I learn a lot of study. And so going back this sutra is awesome. This sutra is really, really beautiful. I didn't, you know, like all sutras, every sutra I've ever read, when I read it again, I'm more impressed than the first time. And so this, you know, should come as no surprise. But in order to make my um, insights or kind of what I saw, I don't want to make it sound so dramatic as insights, but like what I saw, I want to just, um, explain three terms. And what I mean is, is I, I am going to read pretty much verbatim directly from the sutra. I'm going to do what I always do, though, which is that I will uh, course correct, which is which by that I mean, I'm going to uh, change the translation to suit the language that we use in the Dharma doors. So there will be that. But I'm also going to um, when I read it this time, I'm going to stick to, there's these three ideas. <clears throat> let's just get, let's just put it that way. There's these three ideas. Bodhi, Chitta, and Sattva. You might've heard of a Bodhisattva, right? So we've got Bodhisattva and Bodhicitta. So three words, Bodhi, Chitta or Bodhisattva. Sentient being, a sattva, Bodhi, enlightenment, and Chitta, mind. So tonight, I want to start by discussing this. This is the question. When, once I dive into the sutra, you're going to hear it very, very clearly that the Bodhisattva Akshayamati has one question for the Buddha, which is what is bodhicitta? 
And I know that I've already spoken for at least an hour and a half on this question, because that was probably episode one of this. But I'm, I, and I honestly, I have no idea. I have no clue what I said then, but it probably wasn't this. It probably wasn't what I'm about to say. So, <laughs> Bodhi, Chitta, and Sattva. Those are the three words, and I, I probably, when I, when I read this, I'm probably going to not translate those Sanskrit words. So I'm going to keep saying Bodhi, enlightenment. I'm going to keep saying Chitta, which means the mind. And I'm going to keep saying Sattva, which means a being, in particular, a kind of sentient being in that sense. So because I'm going to read this and I'm going to stick to those three words, I want to make clear what's kind of being discussed as we go through this. And then you're going to be able to just kick way back. You're going to kick so far back and just sort of like revel in this, in this Dharma. So Bodhi, enlightenment, right? Bodhi is of course, the root of this idea of Buddha. Buddha is an enlightened being. Bodhi is that very enlightenment of which one who is enlightenment is referred to as a Buddha. So Buddha, Bodhi, related. One is a person who is enlightened and one is that very enlightenment. But so that you don't, you know, so that you have the right idea in, in mind, I want to remind everybody that for me, for me, Michael, MC Owens, when I think of enlightenment, when I think of the, the phrase awakening, which is a word that is used to describe Bodhi, because as I often say, Buddha, Bodhi, the root root of that word is bud, like a flower bud, budding in English and in Sanskrit, budding means awakening, means opening. And so to, to bud, to bodhi, to be a Buddha is awakening, opening, that's the metaphor. But for me, a really, really helpful analogy, and it's actually not the best analogy. It's not the best analogy because I know that everyone has not had a lucid dream in which they have become awake in a dream. And so it's not the perfect analogy because not everybody has had that experience of lucidity or that experience of a lucid dream. But to those who have had a lucid dream, ooh, it is the best analogy because indeed, if you can recall that awakening that you had in that dream, where a moment prior to it, you thought you were in normal reality, you thought you were in reality, and then something either happened or you had a thought or something, and you realized, oh, this is a dream. And at that moment, if you've had a lucid dream, you became lucidly awake, lucidly aware. And it's ironic to say that you were awake because you were dreaming. <laughs> but that is indeed the very idea of this idea of awakening, which is that there is a higher state of awareness. <laughs> and so for me, when one is dreaming, but one, one realizes it's a dream and you become lucidly aware of it, and so your disposition towards the dream changes, your understanding of the dream changes, everything changes. That's a great analogy for the big awakening of Buddhism, which is that this is like a dream. It's not a dream. It's not that you're dreaming. It's not that you're asleep. But it's that the nature of what's going on here is similar. It's similar to a dream state in which there is a, a higher perspective to have on this reality. 
And when one has that higher perspective, that's called awakening, bodhi, enlightenment. Everybody feeling that definition of awakening? This kind of, I like to call it lucid living because it's that same idea where you become lucidly aware, but are still in, you're still in it. You're still here, but your disposition changes. And so it's a form of lucid living awakening that is. And so this awakening, this, this realization that this is dreamlike and that there is this kind of bodhi or enlightenment. Well, that's an interesting idea as it pertains to chitta. The other idea tonight, chitta. In our sutra, if you happen to have the standard English translation of the sutra, of course, chitta is being translated as mind. But mind is tricky. And the Buddhists and Buddha, they're very um, careful about this word chitta in terms of not kind of misconstruing it. And what I mean is, is that it's very helpful to consider mind chitta. In Buddhism, it's helpful to consider it a mind state, a state of mind. And what I mean by that is, is that at any given moment, we find ourselves in a particular state of mind. You're in a particular state of mind right now. And this state of mind that you are in right now is sort of dependent upon, is arisen by that which you are experiencing right now. I mean, the voice, if you're watching the video, all of that. But this mind state that you are experiencing right now is also a product of what you ate earlier. It is a product of your emotional state. It's a product of your reactions to what you're hearing. It's a product of your conditioned responses to what you're hearing and feeling and all of that. It, it's a, it, what your mind state is right now is a reaction to the, the light in the room. Is it bright? Is it dim? Are you chilling? Is it a grocery store? All of these various things, the light, the sound, your stomach, everything and everything all culminates in this. Chitta, a state of mind. <laughs> And what's interesting about Buddhism, of course, is that our chitta, our state of mind, is changing moment to moment to moment to moment to moment. As we digest, as the sun sets, as all of this happens, our chitta is changing. And so what's nice about the idea of a mind state from the perspective of Buddhism is that it avoids this nasty problem of a self, of an entity or of a consistent viewer or experiencer. And actually, it's just this current present chitta. So chitta here is a mind state that has arisen from, again, the body, sensorial experiences, conditioning, perception, all of these ver varieties of, of uh, factors go into producing this mind state. And there's three elements of a mind state that are really, really tricky. And these are, of course, those three poisons, the three kleshas, the attraction, aversion, and confusion, otherwise translated as greed, hatred, and delusion. But the idea is, is that there is a mind state that is being generated by the body here, sensorial senses, sensorial reactions, what you ate, all of this, and uh, like injected into that, also degrees of greedy, wanty, clingy, desirousness, and degrees of angry, bitter, antsy, dissatisfiedness, and a degree of confusion or delusion about what's really going on here which is to say the dreamlike nature of reality. So those three poisons infecting the body with the, the digestion and the light and all of these things, that all culminates in this mind state. And there's a certain way 
in which all of that is problematic. The three poisons, the klesha, the greed, anger, and the delusion, those are the biggest problem. And the main part of the practice is about trying to, I, I, I often call these three malware. They're malware for the system. You have an operating system here that's about sensory organs and all of this stuff. And there's a way in which if all, if all of that was cruising along, you know, senses, responses, if all of it was cruising along kind of in a normal state, it, it sort of things would be kind of just going along, but then we're infected with this malware, <laughs> this vi a virus in a way. It's like the three viruses instead of the three poisons. And it's this idea that the greed and the anger and the delusion are not endemic to this being. And so they can be removed in that way. I got you, Ramit, one second. So they can be removed, but there's still sort of this reaction to the world situation problem going on. And so what I mean is, and what I'm getting at is, is that this mind state, it could do with some relaxation and meditation is the idea. Like the idea is, is that all of this chitta, the mind is sort of like really worked up in a way from all of this. And so the prescription is sort of this chilling it out so that it's not so infected by the poisons and not so stimulated by sensations in that way. Ramit, what do you got? You got sorry, a question on chitta or anybody got questions on chitta in that way? Um, yeah, I didn't really have a question, but it was more the connection of the number three. Um, and I've, I've really been like diving into, I've just been having a lot of conversations and kind of um, listening to other monks talk about their practice. And, um, and, and anyway, so the number three is, I, I've noticed it's, it's a very, like it's a recurring theme in Buddhism, um, uh, especially because like, if, um, so like we have the three kleshas, right? Uh, the very same way the three kleshas can be, um, can also be the three treasures, right? Uh, and and so, so when you say that, um, like if there arises greed or if there arises delusion, or if there arises ignorance, then they are the three treasures in the sense that mm. learning to sense them in itself is the treasure. Right? And so, so and 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 one of the one of the other connections I drew was that uh on, on the Vajra Sattva uh, path and like the um uh what is I don't I don't exactly recall that symbol. Um uh, do you know which, what I'm referring to? It's the, the has a little ball in the middle, which we could call source or whatever. And then it has this little, that, that thing there. Yes, there it is. Yes, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah we, we keep those on deck around here. <laughs> yeah. That's the Vajra. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, just a, an interesting connection I drew. Yeah. Indeed. And Ramit, I don't want to, um, I don't actually, I do not want to dismiss your comment because it's very interesting. It's not totally in line or, you know, with what I was sure. driving at, but it's, a, and so I don't want it to go without recognition. What you're describing is a much kind of deeper teaching actually. I, and, and not that it's not uh, apropos right, right. to our text. Yeah. It's just apropos to this moment in this evening's discussion in right. that regard. Yeah. So yeah, I, I appreciate that though. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I appreciate that very much. Um, so two, th the three things that we are working on our idea of enlightenment or Bodhi, our idea of this um, chitta or mind. And so the Bodhisattva actually asked the, the Buddha about this idea of the enlightened mind the bodhicitta, and what that sort of question, and, and the whole reason why I'm going through this, by the way, is because I don't want to interrupt the reading with this discussion. But it's really 
it's going to be really sweet, I think, if 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 I say all this first. So what the Bodhisattva is asking is this idea of, well, well, then what is the connection or what is the relationship between enlightenment and the mind? Like, like what's going to, what's going to be the relationship between those two? Or even more subtly, what is the bridge or the the process of moving from chitta to bodhi or bodhi to chitta or all of that. That's gonna be part of this really beautiful question that the bodhisattva asks. But if you've heard of bodhicitta and the generation of bodhicitta, you know, that's what this sutra is about is generating an enlightened mind. And so the bodhisattva's question is how does one generate initiate is going to be part of the word too. this initiate an enlightened mind and so the question is actually the bodhisattva is asking buddha hey buddha how do we get enlightened like so let me just clarify that the question at hand is what's enlightenment all about and how do we do it but it's being asked in a very kind of scholastic way, which is about generating bodhicitta, but in particular, in regard to bodhi and chitta. And what I mean to say is, is that bodhi enlightenment, this awakening that I described, it sort of seems to be beyond chitta because chitta thinks it's in the world. Think chitta thinks it's in bottom, you know, terra firma reality. And so this delicate relationship between the enlightened mind and the non-enlightened mind, that's what we're interested in. And we are also interested in the third element of this conversation here, which is the sattva. Now, a sattva is a being, normally a sentient being in that way. You're a sattva, I'm a sattva in that sense. And there's different ways to describe us. We would be human sattvas, and there are more animal sattvas, and there are ghostly sattvas. And so whenever I'm saying sattva, I mean a being, a being, a human being, a, a bird being, a, a ghostly being. So what would it actually mean to be a bodhisattva? Ah, see, that's the kind of the interesting thing here about our bodhisattva. This is not just a, a, um, a, a sattva sattva, and by that I mean, you know, sensory organ, seeing, hearing, and feeling kind of a sattva, and not a ghostly sattva, and, you know, not an animal sattva, a bodhisattva, a, a, a being of enlightenment. So that's a very interesting idea there, a, a bodhisattva. So here we have all of our elements, bodhicitta, a mind of enlightenment, bodhisattva, a being of enlightenment, and then bodhi itself, the idea of this awakening or enlightenment. Michael, I have a quick question yeah, um, in regard to um, chitta. Can I think, if I think about chitta, can I think about the analogy of um, that chitta is like the wave in the ocean? you know, the Buddhist analogy. Yeah, I think that's a, a great analogy for the uh, ephemeral nature of the mind in that way to not try to put a, a, um, a being or an entity on the citta, but just see the arising and the passing away of it in that sense. Sure, I think that would be, yeah, I, again, I think that the, the interesting tricky thing about chitta in Buddhism, and by the way, this word chitta, it does mean mind. And in normal like Sanskrit yoga circles, they're gonna be talking about the mind 
the mind, and it means the mind. It's really within Buddhist, the Buddhist world that this thing sort of has a slightly different connotation of a mind state. And I like mind state because it kind of refers to these elements in a certain configuration. And if the configuration changed to a different configuration, it would be that state, it would be that mind state. But can I say in that context, yeah. could I say, would it be correct if I would say that chitta is actually in a bigger sense, not a noun, but a word? Yeah, I mean, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, nouns in Buddhism are tricky to begin with. So, I mean, in many ways, everything's a verb, sort of, yeah. so to speak. Um, so I would, I would go with that. Yeah, I would go with that. Um, I would. I only have one more thing to say before I want to dive into the reading. Yeah, Tanya. So I was just thinking about the the, the relationship between bodhicitta, bodhicitta and bodhisattva. Yep. So I guess I would. I was thinking, you know, it's like why do you have to have the talk about the mind and the sentient being? Because a sentient being, you would think, would have mind states. But then I was thinking, well, if you are a bodhisattva, you must have bodhicitta. Yeah, <laughs> the two definitely go very hand in hand. Mm -hmm. It's it's getting tricky because I don't I don't want to say too much because of the 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 way the sutra plays out. But yes, there is this sort of intimate relationship between the idea of bodhicitta, meaning the mind of enlightenment, and a bodhisattva, a being who has such a mind as that. And you could get into some Venn diagram logistical arguments of do all bodhisattvas have bodhicitta? Does every one of the bodhicitta, is that a bodhisattva? And generally, I think the idea is yes, the two are sort of synonymous in a certain sense. But the distinction between the two is actually very interesting in terms of the difference between enlightenment vis-a-vis -vis mind and enlightenment vis-a-vis -vis lived bodily experience. And again, those two are already in Buddhism, a very subtle distinction between mind and lived bodily experience. But I do believe that the the um i i yeah the, there's a the reason why there's not just one word but there's two is because there is such a distinction as the enlightened mind and the enlightened being or the bodhisattva great question by the way tanya because it actually affords me this opportunity to mention one last thing that i need to talk about and this is something that i won't belabor because i did talk about it at length probably the first night, if not episode one, two, or three, somewhere in the very beginning. This whole sutra is very much about the, what is called the generation or the initiation of bodhicitta. So that's the key, which is, it's this word in Chinese, it's a fa, and again, refer to the, the, whichever one that was where I talked at length about this idea. And this idea of, I, I actually, tonight I decided I really, really, really wanted to translate this and speak about this as initiation, the initiation of enlightenment. But I actually tonight, I really, I kind of sometimes want to avoid that word because of the connotation it has of being like initiated into something. But actually tonight, I want that connotation. You are being initiated into something if you do this. And so this is indeed about being initiated as a bodhisattva. But what's beautiful about, of course, well, what's, uh, what's beautiful about this, which is what's beautiful about Buddhism, we initiate ourselves. This is this, we take it upon ourselves to do this in that sense. 
And so there's a way in which this is a guide to doing it, but there's nobody who's going to initiate us. So that's going to be my first comment here on this word. There's something in Mahayana Buddhism. I've said this a lot. I say it, um, I probably said it a lot towards the beginning, but there's this idea in Mahayana Buddhism of the initial determination for supreme unsurpassable enlightenment. Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, the enlightenment, the Bodhi, the Sambodhi, not just the Sambodhi, not just the Buddha Bodhi, but the Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, supreme unsurpassable Bodhi. And so there is this enlightened state. It's better than a lucid dream. It's Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi. And that is the supreme unsurpassable Bodhi. And there is a way to develop it, to generate it. And it is usually in Mahayana Buddhism and in sutras and in Buddhist discourse, there is this idea of the initial determination for enlightenment. And that word initial, initi, is this forging ahead this doing it, let's do it. That's this idea of to initiate, to generate. What's interesting about this sutra, and it, it, it gets a little tricky linguistically, this sutra is going to speak about 10 generations of enlightenment. And I joked, whatever night that was that we first talked about this, I made this joke. And I'm sticking with this joke. If you've ever had an old car that you've had to turn over a few times to really get it going, like you had to jig -jig 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 <laughs> imagine you had to jig -jig -jig 10 times, you had to initiate this baby 10 times before you got it fully up and running. That's kind of the idea of this sutra, whereas we are, we're used to the idea of an initial determination for enlightenment. But tonight we're gonna to get 10 initial generations of enlightenment. And I just wanted to remind everybody that the idea of this is, is that there is this initial bringing forth of bodhicitta. And effectively, I guess this is a really long roundabout way of answering Tanya's question. <laughs> there is this initial generation of bodhicitta that makes one a bodhisattva. <laughs> because you've made the initiation in that sense. All right. Um, and just because I probably should say this now, yeah, because it'll make, again, it'll make it a little sweeter, the reading of this. What does Anuttara Samyaksam Bodhi mean? Like, what does the, this generation of Bodhicitta mean? If I could put it very, very simply, <clears throat> I, I mentioned that this is a, a Mahayana Buddhist thing. The, the uh, idea of Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi is rather Mahayana. Certainly the idea of you and I generating the idea of Bodhicitta to attain Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, that's very much a Mahayana Buddhist idea. But what does that mean, a Mahayana Buddhist idea? If I could put it simply, in an earlier version of Buddhism, a very old, you know, kind of form, there was this idea that one made a vow to attain enlightenment in the sense of a vow to attain nirvana, to be released from suffering, and so one made this sort of vow to attain nirvana, to be liberated. Excellent vow, excellent determination. However, <laughs> there is this other vow, this other initiation. And so within the Mahayana tradition, one, a bodhisattva, I should say, doesn't make a vow or a determination to enlighten themselves, they actually make a vow or a determination to 
enlighten everybody else. And I want to make this clear too. The Bodhisattva, while the Bodhisattva is indeed a, a saint, a very you know, virtuous person in that sense, the Bodhisattva does not make this initial determ or the 10 initiation does not make this generation of enlightenment in order to save all sentient beings. They don't do it per se for all sentient beings. And it's a very, very kind of tricky equation. And I, and I know, you know, many of you here have heard all of this before. You're like, come on, Michael, get on with it. Like we want to get to the sutra. But <laughs> what I want to say is, is that there's something about the Mahayana Bodhisattva path where when you hear that, when you hear that the, Bod oh, the Bodhisattva wants to save all sentient beings or enlighten all sentient beings, and you think, wow, that's so noble of the Bodhisattva. And indeed, it is noble of the Bodhisattva to do that. But I want you to understand, or at least I want you to think about that this Bodhisattva who says, I'm going to enlighten everybody. Yes, it's altruistic in that kind of way. But it also comes from a very deep place of wisdom that recognizes that there is no enlightenment until we are all enlightened. Like really, 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 truly in a very, very deep way. And so I don't want to make it sound like the Bodhisattva is ultimately acting from a selfish place because they want to get enlightened and they think the only way to get enlightened is to enlighten everybody else. It's, it's not like that. It's just, I also don't want to make the Bodhisattva seem like a total bleeding heart, sacrificing everything for the other. It's, a, it's from a deeper place of wisdom that really recognizes, and I've said this so many times in Dharma doors, you know, but the realization of the Bodhisattva is that when they are projecting anger out at somebody, they're really just angry <laughs> in, them, in themselves. And the person that they're angry at is not affected or harmed in any way by that anger. So when you're angry, you're really just eating yourself up with, with that. So the Bodhisattva goes, oh, wow. Oh, <laughs> so it works the other way too then, which is that if to this person, I'm utterly compassionate, utterly kind and utterly enlightening, it works better for me in that way. And that is the kind of the Mahayana path of this realization of, oh, I can do this in socially engaged as Thich Nhat Hanh would say, I can do this in the world. And so that is an aspect, if not the aspect of this initial determination for enlightenment. It's not about me getting enlightened, it's like, oh, yeah, I got to become a Buddha so I can enlighten the whole Buddha land. I got work to do. Let's do it. <laughs> okay, that's my long introduction. Uh, yeah, no. Sorry, I, I know we want to get to the future, but I, I think this this uh, I, I keep thinking about and then, and then dropping it and then it comes back this difference between chitta as mind and chitta as mind state mm -hmm. and I'm thinking of it as you know someone who's just a plebe like I am uh, who you know has not experienced what this might be like wondering if a, if a, if a, if an enlightened mind there, you can think of an enlightened mind as a sort of like, oh, you know, your neurons got rewired and now, you know, the, 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 the mind, the physical mind, like it's like a thing versus an enlightened mind state, which seems like it's more transitory, right? Or, 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 you know, subject to going in and out of, right? And, and that kind of goes with this idea of, you know, that there are, 
you, you, you're initiating this 10 times and you're, and it's, it's an active thing and, and it's a verb. And it's like something you don't, you don't just like, I mean, maybe that's the difference between a bodhisattva or someone on the path and an enlightened being. I, I don't know, but you don't just like, oh, I got bodhicitta, I'm good, right? It's, it's more of an active thing that you're doing. And, and to me, the mind state makes that really clear because we all know our mind state changes like constantly. So the practice then is to maintain that mind state. Even, even if you attain it, you're not done. You have to maintain it. Does that make sense? It, it, it does. It does. In fact, I mean, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. You know, uh, what immediately comes to mind, uh, I, I'm hoping that we get to my crazy uh, chart here tonight, but there is a, a point, a, it is a samadhi, it's a stage, it's a stage, it's a bunch of things. But in the cultivation of bodhicitta, in the bodhisattva path, there is there reaches a point where the bodhisattva is is deemed a non-regressing bodhisattva and that idea is this idea that the mind has reached a there's no turn there's no regressing back to a kind of confusion about what's is this a dream is this not a dream is the buddha right is who uh, so there is that point and so along those lines you know the idea gnome is that we are you know, when we understand bodhicitta versus a self, right? So that, and you know, at this point, it's probably when you were talking, Noam, I was like, you know, a helpful an uh, uh, analogy to this is the idea of an experience, mm -hmm. the ephemerality of an experience. It's like, how long does an experience last? Like, where is an experience? Like, what's the continuity of experience? It's much more immediate, present, and that's all it can be is immediate and present. Bodhicitta is very similar to that. The practice, of course, regarding mindfulness is about examining the mind state, degrees of the kleshas, uh, weeding, weed, literally weeding out the roots of the kleshas, developing the uh, wholesome roots in that sense, and ultimately cultivating and developing bodhicitta in this way the enlightened mind state. And I guess that's what I, this has been a long way of wanting to say that, the enlightened mind state versus the enlightened mind as a noun. <laughs> we made it. <laughs> no, thank you, Noam, that was a very great question. I, Michael, I have a brief, brief question. I mean, yeah. you know, thinking about an enlightenment, you know, in and thinking about Buddhist teachings, it often occurs to me that, um, Buddhist teachings sometimes seem to be pretty uh, contradictive in the sense of, um, um, you know, the, the, the path to enlightenment, you, you, you talk about the path and you hear about and read about the path to enlightenment. And then there are teachings that essentially there is no enlightenment. Then it's about, you know, your own enlightenment. And then as a bodhisattva, you come back that everybody is enlightened. And becomes enlightened and then at the same time who are the others and then who is me you know <laughs> like I don't know I find it often really interesting that yeah I don't know if it has something to do with traditions or um, different um, Buddhist schools or I don't know is there anything that you can say to that not only that I can read a sutra I can read you a sutra Connie that that actually addresses that it exact it's not a contradiction but i know what you mean trust me i know exactly what you mean but there's a part what i'm realizing by the way the reason why i want to do this tonight and i'm still going to do it it's i, I realize that when you know because of the way i teach and the way dharma doors goes you know i tend to like read a sentence and stop talk for half an hour, answer a bunch of crazy questions. We spin off on tangents, then we come back and I read another word. And so I think that first night when I read the beginning of this, we kind of might, might have missed the, the real flow of it. And Connie, I think you're, 
your kind of what you're thinking about is really addressed in the sutra by the Buddha in that way. Um, Tanya, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I think it might be related, but when you were talking about the idea that the Bodhisattva is coming from a place of deep wisdom in terms of like, we're not enlightened until everybody's enlightened. It made me think of like dependent origination, non-dual, new non-duality and interpenetration of everything. Right? That's what I, exactly what I meant by the wisdom. The, yeah. The Bodhisattva sees it that way, the, in, the interconnectedness of it all. Yeah. And that's where it's like, oh, nobody's going anywhere until this whole thing is changed. Right. And, and again, there's not anybody to go anywhere in a certain Absolutely. level. And that refers you, to Connie. That's the, exactly. <laughs> kind of going back to what Connie was saying. But, yeah. All right. I'm cutting us off because everybody wants the uh, uh, Shayamati to tell us what's going on with this con these contradictions. Okay. So this is... The Bodhisattva Akshayamati Paripricha Sutra, the questions of Bodhisattva inexhaustible intellect. Thus have I heard, once the Buddha was dwelling near Rajgriha, Rajgir, on Mount Gridakuta, the vulture's peak, together with an assembly of 1,250 monks. There were also 10,000 Bodhisattva great great Mahasattvas present. Among them were Bodhisattva Wisdom Banner, Bodhisattva Dharma Banner, Bodhisattva Moon Banner, Bodhisattva Sun Banner, Bodhisattva Boundless Banner. There were 16 lay Bodhisattvas. There was Bhadrapala, a foremost among them. There were 60 Bodhisattva Mahasattvas of incomparable mind with Manjushri foremost among them, there were all 16 Bodhisattva Mahasattvas of this Bhadra, the worthy Kalpa, with Bodhisattva Maitreya foremost among them. And there were 60,000 other Bodhisattva Mahasattvas with Bodhisattva Akshayamati, inexhaustible intellect at the foremost. At that time, Bodhisattva, inexhaustible intellect, Akshayamati, rose from his seat, uncovered his right shoulder, knelt on his right knee, faced the Buddha with palms joined, and paid homage to the world honored one, bowing down with his head at the Buddha's feet. He scattered precious flowers around the Buddha as an offering and said, world honored one. Sorry, just making sure I didn't. World Honored One. The World Honored One speaks of bodhicitta. What is the meaning of bodhicitta? What are the ways in which a bodhisattva achieves bodhicitta? What is bodhicitta? In bodhi, the mind is inapprehensible. In citta, Bodhi is inapprehensible. Apart from Bodhi, Chitta is inapprehensible. And apart from Chitta, Bodhi is inapprehensible. Bodhi is formless, signless, totally inexpressible. And Chitta is also formless, signless, and unable to be indicated. Thus, too, are Sattva sentient beings. None of the three, bodhi, chitva, or sattva, is apprehensible. World honored one, since all dharmas are inapprehensible as such, by what principle should we cultivate ourselves? <laughs> the Buddha said, good son, listen to me attentively. The Bodhi I speak of intrinsically has no name and no description. And why? Because in Bodhi, in enlightenment, name and descriptions are inapprehensible. The same is true of Chitta and Sattva. Such an understanding is called Bodhicitta. Bodhi, 
enlightenment has nothing to do with the past, nothing to do with the present, nothing to do with the future. Chitta, the mind, and sattva, sentient beings, also have nothing to do with the past, nothing to do with the present, nothing to do with the future. One who understands this is called a bodhisattva. However, in bodhisattvahood, too, there is nothing apprehensible. One who realizes that all phenomena, all dharmas are inapprehensible is said to have attained bodhicitta. An arahat, a worthy one, who has attained arhatship has actually attained nothing. It is only to follow convention that they are said to have attained arhatship. All dharmas are inapprehensible. Bodhicitta is no exception. To guide novice bodhisattvas, bodhicitta is spoken about. But there is neither citta nor the term citta in any of this. Neither is there bodhi nor the term bodhi. Neither sattva nor the term sattva. Neither a shravaka, a voice hearer, nor the term shravaka, voice hearer. Neither a pratekya bhutta or the word pratekya bhutta. Neither bodhisattva nor the word bodhisattva. Neither Buddha nor the word Buddha. Neither conditioned nor the term conditioned neither the unconditioned or the term unconditioned, neither attainment at present nor attainment at some future time. Nevertheless, good son, I will use words as a means of expression to explain. <laughs> First is the initiation of the mind of enlightenment. First is the initiation of the mind of enlightenment by being foremost in the cultivation of all extensive good roots. Just as Mount Sumeru towers above everything else, this is the basis of the paramita of generosity, of giving. Second, is initiation by establishing all of one's undertakings firmly, just as the great earth anchors all things. This is the basis of the paramita of shila, moral discipline. Third is the initiation by having a strong will to bear all afflictions with courage and ease just as an awesome lion fearlessly subdues all other beasts. This is the basis of the paramita of patience, kashanti. Fourth is initiation by having overwhelming power to conquer all kleshas, all defilements, just as Vishnu, Naryarana vanquishes all opponents. This is the basis of the paramita of drive, virya. Fifth is the initiation by cultivating virtues and developing all kinds of good roots, which will blossom like flowering parajita and kovidara trees. This is the basis of the paramita of meditation, dhyana. Sixth is the initiation by eradicating ignorance and delusion. Just as the boundless light of the sun dispels all darkness, this is the basis of the paramita of wisdom, pranya. Seventh is the initiation 
by consummating all meritorious aspirations and all glorious adornments so that one can deliver people from dangers and disasters, just like a wealthy merchant who uses their resources skillfully. This is the basis of the paramita of upaya, skillful means. Eighth is the initiation by overcoming all obstacles and thus acquiring a mind that is perfectly peaceful and pure as a clear full moon. This is the basis of the paramita of power, bala. Ninth is the initiation to adorn and purify all beings in all Buddha lands, to perform all wholesome deeds and to succeed in whatever one does. Just as a poor person who acquires inexhaustible treasures can fulfill all their wishes. This is the basis of the paramita of will, pranidana. And 10th is the initiation by acquiring merit and knowledge as boundless as space and to master all dharmas, like an anointed universal monarch, master of the world. This is the basis of the paramita of knowledge, jnana. Good son, one who succeeds in cultivating these 10 initiations to generate bodhicitta is called a bodhisattva, a preeminent being, a being free of hindrances, not an inferior being. Yet, since the reality of things is inapprehensible, there is actually neither a sattva, nor a citta, nor a bodhi in any of this. All right. That's the end of the first part. That's what I didn't get to do, I think, the first night, was actually read that whole arc. In, in many ways, I hope, Connie, you heard why I was like, hold on, hold on, the Buddha's going to answer your question. Buddhism is so aware of language <laughs> and the role of language as a convention, as a social convention, as a convenience, but also the deeper semiotic linguistic aspects of language in terms of thinking and all of that. And so he gives this whole thing and he says, yeah, but in terms of actual enlightenment, no language, no words, no, it's beyond all of that. However, since we're here, I'll use some language to explain. And Connie, therein begins all contradictions, if you know what I mean, because the Buddha's already said, regarding real enlightenment, yeah, no beings, no sattvas, no enlightenment, no mind. But we'll use language and we'll talk about beings, we'll talk about Connie and Michael, we'll talk about minds, we'll talk about delusion and ignorance and enlightenment, but those are all gonna be words. So at that point, of course, in the text, the Buddha goes on to give 10 practices for each of the paramitas. I'm not going to read all through that. That's the heart of the sutra. That's the, the real, um, yeah, it's the real heart of the sutra, the real practice, the real ideas. Um, and so that's what we spent the bulk of our time together on are those 10. However, after the Buddha describes those 10, which I don't have up on the board, but I do have our paramitas here, which were just listed. These were, those were the ways that you initiate uh, bodhicitta by way of generosity, moral discipline, patience, drive, meditation, wisdom. I've, I've, I'm going, by the way, tonight for upaya, skillful means. It's usually skillful means. I think a beautiful way of thinking about upaya, the seventh paramita, I've translated it tonight as adaptability. And it's not a bad translation of it. It, it doesn't capture everything that's involved in upaya. 
in other words, I, I'm not a huge fan of adaptability because indeed adaptability means like going with the flow, just being chill, going along, not being Mr. Uh, oppositional or whatever. That's definitely adaptability. The only reason I'm not super crazy about it is, is that it, it's a little passive for me. Whereas skillful means and upire are a little more active because it's actually sort of a pedagogical, heroistic kind of teaching thing in that way. So skillful means or skillfulness is, a, is always a preferred translation of upaya, but I'm going with adaptability tonight. And then we have our power, our bala, pranidana, which is just will, intention, and then jnana. So those are the paramitas that were listed as these initial generations. Then we get 10 practices for each of those paramitas. And then the Buddha says, furthermore, when a bodhisattva is about to abide in this first stage, they will first have a vision and they will have a vision of all the hundreds of thousands of millions of myriads of hidden treasures buried within this 3000 great thousand world system. When a bodhisattva is about to abide in the stage of stainlessness, the second stage, they will first have a vision of this 3000 great thousand world system with its ground as flat as one's palm and with pure adornments of innumerable hundreds of thousands of millions of myriads of precious lotus flowers. When a bodhisattva is about to abide in the stage of radiance, prabhakari, the third stage, they will first have a vision of themselves clad in armor, holding a wand, repressing enemies dauntlessly and resolutely. When a bodhisattva is about to abide in the stage of refulgent, radiant mind, Arkishmati, the fourth stage, they will first have a vision of all kinds of rare flowers being scattered over the ground by the wind from the four directions. When a bodhisattva is about to abide in the stage that is hard to master, Sudarjaya, the fifth stage, they will first have a vision of women with crowns of garlands of Atimutaka, Varishika, and Kampaka flowers, their bodies variously adorned. When a bodhisattva is about to abide in the stage of manifestation, Abhimukhi, the sixth stage, they will first have a vision of a beautiful pond filled with pure, lucid water, having eight merits, Gold sand will form the bottom of that pond. Four jeweled flights of steps will be on its side, and it will be adorned with blue, red, white, and various colored lotus flowers. And they will see themselves playing in that pond. When a bodhisattva is about to abide in the stage Duramgama, Ganafar, the seventh stage, they will first have a vision of the hell realms to their left and to their right, but they will see themselves passing through unharmed. When a bodhisattva is about to abide in the stage of immovability, achala, the eighth stage, they will first have a vision of themselves bearing all the marks of a lion king on their shoulders, causing all the other animals to run in fear. When a bodhisattva is about to abide in the stage of the subtle mind, sadhumati, the ninth stage, they will first have a vision of themselves as a universal monarch teaching the true dharma, surrounded by innumerable hundreds of thousands of millions of myriads of kings, shaded by various clean, clear, jeweled canopies. And when a bodhisattva is about to abide in the stage of the dharma cloud, the dharma mega, the 10th stage, they will first have a vision of themselves, their body the color of true gold, complete with all the 32 auspicious marks of a Tathagata, haloed with a circle of light several feet in radius. They will be seated comfortably on a broad high lion throne, surrounded by innumerable hundreds of thousands of millions of myriads of gods from the Brahma heaven, 
who will respectfully make offerings to them and listen to them preach the Dharma. Good son, due to the power of samadhi, a bodhisattva mahasattva will have each of these 10 visions respectively prior to their attainment of each of the 10 stages. And furthermore, good son, a bodhisattva in the first stage perfects the paramita of generosity. In the second stage, they perfect the paramita of moral discipline. In the third stage, they perfect the paramita of patience. In the fourth stage, the paramita of drive, virya. In the fifth stage, the paramita of meditation, dhyana. In the sixth stage, the paramita of wisdom, pranya. In the seventh stage, the paramita of adaptability, skillful means, upaya. In the eighth stage, the paramita of bala, power. In the ninth stage, the paramita of will, pranidana. And in the 10th stage, the bodhisattva perfects the paramita of knowledge, jnana. Furthermore, good son, a bodhisattva who brings forth the initial determination for enlightenment will attain the jewel manifesting samadhi. And that brings us to this new section for tonight and not a minute too soon. So we have now concluded our summary of the whole sutra. And we are now at a new moment where after the Bodhisattva has made these initial determinations for enlightenment by practicing these 10 paramitas, thereby reaching these 10 stages. During all that, <laughs> while that's all going on, but the Bodhi, or I guess, let me just read it again. Furthermore, a Bodhisattva who brings forth the initial determination for enlightenment will attain the jewel manifesting samadhi. And there's nine more samadhis to go. And so before I mention them, and aren't you glad I'm not doing one night on each of these samadhis? So in order to summarize these all in one night, and the only, actually the reason why I'm not doing these all in one night, and the reason why I wanted to try to do the whole, I guess, first part of the sutra in one shot, was so that you could hear and maybe feel the parallels going on. I mentioned early on, you know, that everything happening at the first stage, first paramita, initial generation of enlightenment, these are all kind of in a correspondence. And as you go up to the second, the second paramita and the second stage and the second initiation and the third and the fourth. So there's like parallels or correspondences between all these. And I wanted you to sort of start to hear them. So when we hear that a bodhisattva who generates the initial uh, determination for enlightenment, they attain this samadhi of the manifestation of jewels. Well, remember that the first vision that a bodhisattva has is of this hidden jeweled treasury found in the 3,000 Great Thousand World System. In other words, if you're a Dharma nerd like I am, you can go through and really start to sort of detect the, the themes that are happening in each of these and the way that these samadhis correspond to them. I, it, I, it would be bereft of me if I didn't give you a good definition of samadhi and talk about samadhi right now, right? So samadhi, samada, it's also samada. This samadhi or samada, you translate it as concentration. Even I, I've just gone for the standard translation as concentration. 
you know, samadhi or samadha is a, it's a tricky thing to talk about. I say this often, you know, we don't have enough words in English for this stuff. We have this one word meditation that kind of covers the whole gambit of um, non-physically active activities in that way. Like, oh, you're just sitting there thinking, you're meditating. <laughs> like, oh, you're not doing anything, must be meditating. So like anything that's not physically active is meditative, I guess. But the idea is, is that this samadhi or samadha, you know, this has been considered the, the highest state of meditation for a long time. Way before the Buddha, there were people who were trying to reach this state of samadhi. And, you know, I've spoken a lot about samadhi. I've done Dharma talks on samadhi. And I don't want to make this all about that. What I do want to talk about, though, is sort of like why, why these, why this in that way. So an a very important part of this is um, like, yeah, so What's going to going on here with a lot of this, and I say this often, you know, that this type of Buddhism with the jewels and the flowers and all of the visions and all of this kind of stuff, this type of Mahayana Buddhism, it's very much in dialogue with an earlier type of Buddhism. They call it Shravakayana Buddhism. They call it Pratekya Buddha Buddhism. It's an idea that the Mahayana has for that earlier type of Buddhism that was exclusively interested in one's own enlightenment. Like there was this early period in which Buddhism was understood as a self-help program. That's it. And that, that version of Buddhism that's sort of exclusively a self-help program can be called Shravakayana, the voice hearer path. And I'm, the idea here is, is that that original form of Buddhism that was about our hotship, Shravaka is in that sense, that was about the self-help all the way to Nirvana, they speak of samadhis as these attainments, as having attained certain states of mind, certain meditative concentrations. Again, I'm avoiding going into a deep discussion about what samadhis are because we're uh, because of the time. But I want you to know that samadhis, of course, are a pre-Buddhist idea. They've always been a part of Buddhism. But in that earlier form of Buddhism, samadhis were like, you know, it was almost sort of like a, yeah, I made it to the state of nothingness yesterday. It's pretty fresh. Like it was this kind of attainment, like, oh, wow, you made it to the samadhi of infinite nothingness? Wow. And so there was a way that these samadhis were spoken of as attainments, that you reached certain levels of meditation. I say that, I want to remind you that there's that kind of critique going on, because part of the beautiful ornate, almost Baroque floweriness of all of this is because they're trying to be kind of funny in a way. And I don't mean ha ha funny, but they're trying to be very like, I, the word I want to use is hyperbolic. They want to be very grandiose and hyperbolic to take this out of the head and out of that kind of way of thinking of samadhis. And so I just want to make that point that these 10 samadhis, if you're kind of thinking about them linearly and vertically and successively, and you're like, oh, I can't wait to get into that, that samadhi, then you might be missing the joke in that way is sort of what I'm getting at. And so these are these 10 samadhis that correspond to these 10 stages. 
and I do want to go through them after I hear from Rami. <laughs> uh, yeah, first of all, that's been amazing. Like, uh, so so refined and fine tuned. Uh, so yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, and, and then uh, I, then I was also gonna say that uh, I definitely agree. Like, I think recognizing the universality of of uh, samadhi or or you know like like people call it one pointedness, right? Uh, but one pointedness is just learning to change the aperture, right? And so, so, um, so it's, it's learning to like, see how granular you can get. Uh, but at the same time, you know, how, how, gra how granular, like, that's why I think the, 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 so much, so much emphasis on like grains of the gang, the Ganji, mm -hmm. right? Right. And it's like, it's, it's that, is the ability to like, I guess, contract and expand simultaneously. Hmm. Um, that is so like, so just evident in all the similes and um, uh, language of Buddhism. So yeah, just another tidbit. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Um, yeah, thank you. Luke, you have a question. Hi, Luke. Welcome. Oh, can't hear you, Luke. Got it, got it. You have me? I can, yep. Okay. I was asking about samadhi. Samadhi is not a linear, uh, a, a linear, uh, uh, they're not linear steps where you become something. They're nonlinear. There's, it's a nonlinear access to power, right? Like you, I, I, that's how I'm getting it. I, I, I don't know if I'm right about this or not, you know? Oh, well, again, let me, you know, at the at the risk of starting a dharma talk on samadhi which i'm always willing to take that risk there was this pre-buddhist definition of samadhi single pointed awareness single pointed focus the the most important thing i think i could say about the original early definition of samadhi and rem, and it's helpful linguistically to know that this samadhi it's samada and it means bringing it all together bringing it all together and one aspect of that bringing it all together that samada is originally when one achieved samadhi there was sort of this union with the divine union with ishvara or whatever and there was a way in which in some early traditions like that was moksha or liberation okay moksha yeah yeah, yeah. And but the idea was is that in an early Buddhist tradition, samadhis were out. You were out, you were gone. You were like, you know, and either you were, you know, it's hard to it's hard to really get to talking about it because from somebody else's point of view, you're sitting there cross-legged. Yeah, can I also add like yeah, yeah. It's exactly that, right? It's like uh it's it's like it's like you are gone, right? But, and then the questions or the self inquiry or the refining, whatever we call it starts is like, well, who, right? And then that's the Samadhi concentration is like, is the question mark or, yep. Well, okay, but hold, hold yes. I, 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 so yeah, this is really, 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 really tricky. It's tricky because this word is so, um, it's so old, it's so used in so many different ways. And so the main thing that I was trying to get across was like a, a three-step process of pre-Buddhist, early Buddhist, and then Akshaya Mati Samadhi. The pre-Buddhist was a, seemingly a, 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 an escape route out of samsara, an escape route out of this realm. Being in life sucks, so let's go deep states of meditation, bliss, rapture, power, all of these things. So that was sort of an original idea and why it was considered moksha or liberation in a way. The Buddhist, the early Buddhist sort of did a slight twist on samadhi and you'll, you, it's helpful to keep in mind that the eighth step on the Noble Eightfold Path is samyak samadhi, right samadhi. And what the idea of right samadhi implies is that there's a wrong samadhi. And as I have come to understand and teach this, 
The wrong samadhi is the type that's like, let's get out of here. Let's just go be in bliss with Ishvara. Bye, everybody. I'll be in, I'll be in samadhi. That was considered sort of wrong samadhi. And right samadhi in the early Buddhist tradition seems to have been this qu just quieting the mind, quieting the mind, stiller, 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 until you transcend the realm of form and you are in the formless realm. And then there are stages of samadhi that lead to absolute total stillness. No power, no Ishvara, nothingness actually. A still tranquil pond that then one arises from, like rest, like sleep, and then comes back into the world clear-headed, clear-minded, free of samskaric conditioning. That's considered right samadhi in the early tradition. You dip in, rest, come out. In this version though, things have gotten even crazier though. And what, and that's all I may, meant to say in my original comment was that even that version of Samadhi, where it's like, no, 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 we just rest and then you calm down and then you go to stillness and then you come back to us. It's still rather predicated on the axis of the self. And so I'm suggesting that the Mahayana view of Samadhi is kind of psychedelic and interesting and, and weird because they're trying not to reinforce the idea of you being in samadhi. And by that, of course, we mean the ego, small sense of self in that way. So those are just a few kind of like quick comments on samadhi. I hope that for folks who know the other traditions are like, oh, that's, that's kind of interesting. Just because I don't want to... Um, draw this again. <laughs> I am, I am going to go through these really quickly. Um, I just want you to know that the Bodhisattva who brings forth the second initiation, that second generation of enlightenment that corresponds with moral discipline, right? They will attain the well-abiding samadhi, the chilling I think that's how you trans just chilling samadhi, right? Well abiding, right? The bodhisattva who brings forth the third initiation of enlightenment will attain the achala samadhi, the immovable samadhi. The bodhisattva who attains the fourth generation of enlightenment will attain the non regressing samadhi. The bodhisattva who makes that fifth initiation of enlightenment will attain the jeweled flower samadhi. The bodhisattva who makes the sixth initiation of enlightenment will attain the light of the sun samadhi. The sixth, that sixth uh, initiation corresponding uh, with pranya, with that wisdom. The Bodhisattva who makes the seventh initiation of enlightenment corresponding to the paramita of upaya, adaptability or skillful means, will attain the samadhi of the realization of the meanings of all things. The realization of all meaning. The Bodhisattva who makes the eighth initiation of enlightenment will attain the samadhi of the torch of wisdom. The Bodhisattva who makes the ninth initiation of enlightenment will attain the Samadhi of direct realization of all Buddha Dharma. And the Bodhisattva who makes the 10th initiation of enlightenment will attain the Shurangama Samadhi, which means durable or something to that effect. I was waiting for Eric Yay. So there's a whole sutra actually called the Shurangama Samadhi Sutra. There's a sutra even just called the Shurangama Sutra. There's two different sutras, the Shurangama Samadhi Sutra, Shurangama uh, Sutra. 
interesting that in this schema, the highest stage of Samadhi corresponding to the 10th Bhumi is the Shurangama. This is a, it's an interesting word, Shurangama. I'm translating it as durable. The root of Shurangama is Agama. Agama means broad or long or far. And so the idea of Shurangama, durability sort of works because it's this idea of like refined and having made it through long periods of time, you have endured. There's a sense of like endurance to this, um, but not through perseverance, but just through um, integrity in that sense. So those are the 10 Samadhis. That's basically just about time. Any questions, comments, answers, or ideas about the Bodhisattva path? Yeah, Tanya. I was just wondering, is there a copy of the whiteboard available? Yeah, yeah, it should be. Um, I think because I emailed it to Gnome, and so usually those are available at some point. Thanks. Um, yeah. Um, and I tried my best here to get the correspondences in line. Of course, I tried to not make the samadhis too linear, as we talked about our friend, um, the idea of the samadhis not really being linear in that sense, so they're more rounded <clears throat> uh, another thing i would add just because like i personally love the body um and i love like you know um like wiz like wisdom practice or or wizardry practice without putting it in the body means nothing so i feel like if you know if you just look at the drawing and maybe it's just a connection i drew maybe it was intentional but um you know, if you look at Samadhi at the bottom as the spine, mm. yeah, right. Um, so you can you can you can learn to understand that. Um, you know, when the Buddha like abides on a cloud or something, and and provides a parasol, and I think this is why the lotus, like literally, and this has one of, been one of my practices to kind of ground it in the body, is I like first of all, a perfect lotus is is, is that's made up, right? Perfect lotus is perfect lotus is different for each body, right? And so if you recognize that okay, samadhi could just be this point of you know the spine, and the spine can just stack on itself, right? And so if the Buddha was to simply trace each mm. vertebra, even that itself could be learning to climb the ladder of yeah. Mm. I'm, I'm with it. <clears throat> I'm totally with it. Um, because I also mentioned that or at some point one night, there was definitely this, you know, I mentioned, of course, that the 10 stages are an ascension. But at some point, I did mention that there was seemingly kind of some correspondence with the lower chakras or more down below. And as we move towards the crown chakra, things start to get headier and headier in that way the bottom's a little more embodied. We're talking about moral discipline and giving. It's a little more body practice. As we move up towards the top, we're talking wisdom. We're talking knowledge is the highest in that sense, yeah. right? If you, if you even like, you know, just draw the connections, like even as you speak of this stuff, right? Like you notice people putting their head on their, put, putting their hands on their head, you know? And, and okay. it's like, oh my gosh, I can't let them see. Like, I can't let them see my seeing. Nah. Or <laughs> or is, like, is, the light, is the light coming out too much? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so it's, it's, it's interesting. Like the more you, you pay attention to these things and the more you recognize like, hey, those, those veins I see on your head are, could be, hmm. <laughs> so, so yeah, that's another uh, easy way to embody it. Yeah. Great comment. Thanks for that. All right, everybody, then that's going to be it for part whatever of the sutra. Um, quick uh, flash forward to next week. There's another set of 10 coming. By the way. And so next week is going to be a very interesting. If you don't know about Dharanis, mantras and Dharanis, magic spells, that's next week. So if that's not enticing, I don't know what is. <laughs> so.